Well, g'day curd nerds. Have you ever wondered what goes into making these videos? Well, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes, let me tell you. Uh, what I've done is I've taken a time-lapse video over five hours of cheese making and it's compressed down to something like three minutes. Quite amazing. Anyway, allow me to narrate you through the making of a cheese making video. Well, as you can see there, I've just put my pot and put all the utensils in it and I've set my cameras and my lights up. Yes, I used some pretty powerful lights there. That's why you get such a good quality picture. I've got the milk sitting on the side there, um, coming up to room temperature. And I've got my ingredients sat on a chopping board with a tea towel over the top. Just waiting for, oh, there we go. Just pulling out all the utensils there after they've been sanitized and just putting my little pot on a pot. Starting to put the milk in. These are all separate shots within the video usually. And giving it a good stir, making sure the cream's incorporated back in. And I'm measuring out the ingredients now while I'm waiting for the milk to heat up. As you can see there, I'm doing the calcium chloride and the rennet. Uh, don't like to do that too far ahead of time. Taking some obligatory uh, photos. And give the milk a bit of a stir. And we're going to add some of the ingredients in now. Just taking the pot off the heat while it's uh, culturing. And uh, he's gone missing in action. Don't know where he's gone. Anyway, there we go, back again, and adding the calcium chloride and the rennet, and just covering that. There we go, and we'll check for a clean break in a minute. So I think I'm stirring the curds there, could be up that stage, pretty sure it is. Stirring for a long time. <laughs> I think I stirred for a whole hour during this video. And I'll just put the pot back on the uh, the little pot just to, uh, to keep the warm, the milk warmed up. I think we're going through the heating stage or something like that. Always checking the time, always checking the temperature. But you can see that this is sped up. This is about five hours of footage. There we go. Always at the stove. During this time, I'm usually listening to some music or some podcasts. Now, as you noticed, it didn't include things like draining, which would have added on probably another 30 minutes to this cheese. It didn't add anything like pressing uh, or aging of the cheese. It also didn't show the post-production part where I actually edit the video, which can take up to sometimes between two hours if I've already done a voiceover narration like this uh, or if I have to do the whole shebang sometimes up to a day maybe two. Sometimes the cheese making videos take many months to make as you can imagine because sometimes I like to show the entire process going from the milk all the way through the affinage or maturation down to the finished taste test and sometimes the cheeses take a long, long time to make. So now you've seen the kitchen, let's have a look at behind the scenes in the studio. So back in the day when I first started recording, this was the camera I had. It was a little 1080p um, handy cam sort of thing, fully digital. Now I've kind of upgraded since then and now I'm using the Panasonic Lumix G7, which is a 4K capable camera and you've probably seen it shooting in most of my videos. You wouldn't have seen the camera, you would have seen the footage that comes from the camera. It's an absolute delight to use. It's a four thirds camera, it's not a full frame camera, but it is amazing, great shots. Now, when I use the lapel mic, this is a thing called a Rode Link Filmmaker Kit. And it has a receiver on top of the camera, the transmitter and the lapel microphone. Great little piece of kits. Audio sounds really good. Now, when I'm in the kitchen, I'll use this microphone mostly. The other microphone I use is what's known as the Video Mic NTG. It's just come out, and it's a great piece of kit. I use it for live streams. 
and you would see that the quality on the live streams, the audio quality is a lot better. There's a top-down view. It's got a self-contained battery. Uh, it has 30 hours of charge. It's pretty cool. Now, the lighting kits I use are the same. They're panel LED lights made by Aperture, and they have two whopping great big batteries that sit on the back. Take a while to charge, but uh, you do have a battery pack that you can use as well. It doesn't have any color control. It's the same uh, cool white color, and I find that pretty good for the videos, so there's no hassle there. Now, into the studio itself, you can see that I've got two 4K monitors, a lot of sound gear there as well, plus I've got a dedicated camera now for live streaming, and that is the Panasonic G7. So I've got two of them, one for filming in the kitchen and one for live streams with the NTG mic on top. There's the mic there. You'll notice there's a cable hanging out of the camera. That is a HDMI camera, a cable, that then goes into the Elgato HD60, which you'll see a shot of in a minute. The microphone is great because it's a boom microphone, so it doesn't pick up noise from the sides or anything like that. There's the HD60S. That converts the HDMI into uh, digital, which goes into the computer. That is my compressor gate. Lots of knobs on it, but you don't turn them ever. You set and forget, uh, and it helps the sound. This is the Stream Deck, which I use during live streams. All those buttons help me control the live stream between two different uh, camera angles and the like. The mixer is a Yamaha MG12XU. 12 inputs, I use about five of them, and uh, it is really good for recording these sort of voiceovers and for the live streams as well. The microphone that I prefer to use for the voiceovers is the ATR2100 and that is a USB and an XLR microphone. It has two outputs and I'm using a boom arm there to keep it stable and there's a shock mount on it to stop any vibration. Now as far as the software goes I use Adobe Premiere Pro Creative Cloud and it is a very good piece of software. I have gone from some really bad Windows video software which I'll describe later on um, to this and it really does help because there are so many video tutorials available on YouTube to help the novice like me create fairly good looking videos. Now as for the PC itself you can see that the CPU is a AMD Ryzen 7 1800 and it's got eight cores so that's why I can process video very quickly. Uh, it doesn't take much time at all and if it is taking a bit of time then the memory also helps as well. There's 32 gigabytes of RAM within the computer. I have two disks in it. One's a three terabyte disk, which is a Western Digital, and the other one is a um, SSD. It's a NVRME, which is a, it's a chip, basically, that goes into your motherboard, and it's the hard drive. Very good. Uh, that's the C drive. It also has a gigabit Ethernet, which you'll see in a second. Uh, and this helps me connect to my NAS filer, which you won't see in the video, uh, but the NAS filer stores all the files, all the videos, so I've got a backup of them. And the GPU is a NVIDIA GeForce 1080 Ti, which is great. So when I first posted this video for my YouTube members and patrons, I had a question from Patricia. Well, Patricia said, uh, thanks for the video, Gavin. I would have found it interesting to hear more about the video making process, how you can tell if your subject is properly framed or focused. Uh, older videos had the sound recorded as you worked, but newer ones are all post-production. So I was wondering what made you change that. Um, are, there any other, are there any other interesting evolutions or modifications you've made over the years to uh, when planning and executing a video. So all great questions, so let's answer those. Um, how do I know if things are framed properly? Well, I remote control the camera, as you can see here, and that may look a little bit freaky, but I remote control the camera and focus it using my app. If I'm doing a shot kind of like this, or in the kitchen standing, presenting to the camera. So that's how I know whether I framed my shot properly and whether I've focused it okay. 
Uh, I do the same thing on live streams and make sure that everything's all focused. Now the camera at the moment is running via a external uh, battery pack via USB and that's plugged into one of my monitors so I can continuously record and you've probably seen that on my live streams as well. So that was the first question. Um, older ones were recorded via straight to the video so I was talking the same time I was recording when I was making the cheese. Now I found that was a bit of an issue because if I wanted to speed up the footage I was still talking about stuff so you missed all of that audio. And the audio quality wasn't that good because it was using the onboard camera microphone. So I thought, well, there's got to be a better way. So what I do now, as you've seen in most of the cheese making videos, is that I record the uh, voice post-production. So I do a voiceover uh, and I use uh, that lovely microphone that you saw uh, that was on the boom arm, the ATR 2100. Um, which is made by Audio Technica. You would have seen that anyway. Uh, so that's some of the, what, the reason I made that change uh, to the post-production video. So any other evolutions? Well, I've gone through so many video softwares. Um, it's just incredible. So the very first one I used was Window Movie Maker. Um, very rudimentary. Some of my really early, earlier videos were made using Windows Movie Maker. Uh, then I moved on to uh, Pinnacle Studio, I think. Let me have a look. What was it called? Uh, yeah, Pinnacle Studio. I used that for a while. And then that kept crashing all the time for whatever reason. Um, and I never figured it out. So then I moved on to Cyberlink uh, Power Director, which worked okay. And then there were just some things that I just couldn't do. And I wanted to do um, some pretty cool things like... Um, um, you know, titles over video and stuff like that as they moved, moved with the video, you couldn't do that. Um, and I wanted to get to an industry standard for video makers, um, so I chose Adobe Premiere Pro, uh, and you've seen a clip of that. Uh, Premiere Pro is so easy to use because there's so, not, not as in easy for the beginner because it's quite difficult, um, it's easy because there are so many tutorials on YouTube. And that really helps. Um, and that certainly helped me when I wanted to do something and I wasn't quite sure how to do it. Jump onto YouTube, quick search, bang, easy, the, the tutorial's there. So that's the, the beauty of having something like Adobe Premiere Pro on a Windows machine or Final Cut Pro 10 um, on a, uh, an Apple or a Macintosh. Um, so there's some of the, the benefits there. Um, other evolutions, obviously just the gear. I've gone from um, really bad lighting to good lighting and uh, a lot better cameras and I can now shoot in 4K as well, um, even though this video is in 1080p. I wanted to be able to edit it a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, all of the patron money and the YouTube membership money is going to good use with the gear that I've been able to use because cheese making part of making a video is just one little thing um, and it's the gear behind it and the, how I use the technology to make the videos and make them as simply as they look um, there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes as you know anyway I'll take you back to Gav in the kitchen well thanks for watching curd nerds hope you enjoyed the brief video that was time-lapsed um, and it was actually the Barata failure video that I did the time lapse on. Once again, thanks for watching Curd Nerds and I'll see you next time.